Meanwhile, another Democratic presidential hopeful has officially surged past President Trump when it comes to online ad spending. Former Vice President Joe Biden's campaign has dished out a million and a half dollars on Google and Facebook ads since the beginning of this year. Just a few months ago, the Trump campaign was outspending all 2020 Democrats combined, but now Biden and Senator Kamala Harris lead the pack. Axis Media reporter Sarah Fisher has written about this story. She is with us now from Washington. Good to see you, Sarah. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. So what's the biggest takeaway from the research that you're doing over at Axios, especially as Joe Biden surges past the Trump campaign when it comes to shelling out all this money on digital ads? Yeah, well, the big concern for Democrats this cycle was, were they going to learn from past mistakes and really invest in digital? We know that Democrats have done some really smart things on digital. Remember, Obama was the social media candidate. But when it comes to ad spending, there was a lot of feedback from last campaign that they were investing too much in TV. So what we're seeing from this data is that the Democrats are finally going in on digital. They're investing in Google. They're investing in Facebook. And that matters because you're able to get really smart data from how how people engage with ads to inform campaign strategy down the line, whether that's buying TV ads or where you should go canvas. So can we take from this that perhaps Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are the front runners in this race, at least at this point? I mean, it's a hard thing to say. You know that they're the front runners on what they're spending online. And I do think there is a correlation to how much somebody is spending versus how much momentum there is. Remember, you're not going to be able to invest that much in advertising unless you're getting a lot of money from, quite frankly, fundraising. So you could say that that means that they have an edge. But I also think it's important to note it's a little too early to tell. We are tracking at Axios what people are spending month over month because we think it matters. But at the end of the day, as we saw from that chart, that we had published and from the full data set, it can change on the dime. Donald Trump was outspending Democrats two to one in January, and now the exact opposite is happening, where Democrats are outspending Donald Trump two to one. Can I ask Sarah about uh, Twitter? I, I know the president is an avid Twitter user, everybody knows that, uh, but I wonder how much of an impact that has on the people who support him or the people who don't support him? Because I, I think that sometimes we live in this D.C., New York bubble where those of us in the media are constantly checking Twitter. But I know, for example, members of my own family who don't even have Twitter accounts and um, don't use it as much. So does that matter, that advertising, that free advertising the president gets to get his message out on social media? It definitely matters. The president is very good at striking messages that resonate with his base, especially on things like Twitter. But at the end of the day, you don't see a lot of candidates spending a lot of ad money on Twitter right now. You don't see a lot of them investing too, too much in that message, because as you said, it can be very much an echo chamber. You have somebody who supports a candidate that follows them on Twitter. They're more likely to, quite frankly, be invested in that candidate no matter what. Uh, so the big thing to watch here, even though Twitter matters, is really Google and Facebook. Book. That's where you're going to move mm. more needles. So this entire conversation is happening as we're also having another conversation about how these tech giants need to be regulated by the government, need to be restricted. They need to do a better job at controlling sort of fake news and all that sort of thing. I mean, is that something we should be maybe talking about? Does that have an impact on the way they, uh, these candidates spend their money? so interesting you say that, because when we did this report earlier in the year, I think in March, we saw that Elizabeth Warren was spending the most for Democrats at the time. Well, of course, part of her campaign platform is to break up big tech. And a lot of people said, look, she is reinforcing that point, that there is no better marketing vehicle than Google and Facebook because of their dominance she has to spend. So I do think that these arguments go hand in hand. In one case, these platforms are so big that the presidential candidates that want to break them up feel forced to spend on them. Them. But on the other, you could say it's quite hypocritical. Do you have to spend on Google and Facebook? Couldn't you buy TV ads? Couldn't you buy radio ads? I would say, personally, as somebody who writes about this every day, that these tech platforms have become so integrated in the marketing stack that you have to spend on them in order to really have a leg up in campaigning these days. Well, there's also, uh, you know, spending on streaming candidates. We're available here. <laughs> I mean, probably shouldn't no, do that. Is that a violation of all kinds of, like, journalistic? Well, no. I mean, if you think about it, we, you know, we, on streaming platforms, just like us, we had every single presidential contender, yeah. with the exception of maybe Hillary Clinton that came by yeah. on CBSN at one point uh, throughout that campaign. Um, and so the other question, I guess, becomes, uh, as these numbers come to some of these 2020 candidates who are willing to criticize 
certain platforms, mm -hmm. like, for example, Facebook and Google. They're calling for regulation, but they're still willing to use Google and Facebook for their own means. What, what is the significance of that? I think it means, quite frankly, that they feel that these platforms have become so big and so dominant that they can't help but use them. And so it kind of actually plays into their argument that they're too big, that one can't avoid, uh, quite frankly, using them for their campaign. But I want to go back to what you said about streaming, because this yeah. is huge. One of the things that you're going to start to see, maybe not so much this year, but definitely in 2024, is that candidates are going to flock to things like audio and podcasts and connected TV, mm. so streaming. And the reason that is, is because it's becoming easier to buy ads on those platforms in a really cheap and efficient way. So that's another thing I would keep your eyes out for, that in the past we just used regular TV, now we're using regular TV and the digital, and in the future expect regular TV, digital, and a lot of streaming TV and podcasts. Well, you know, it's, it was always striking to me that um, when Elaine Keanu, from CBSN was picked to be the moderator of the vice presidential debate. Mm -hmm. My first thought was that, because I, I didn't know how it worked, I thought all the networks pitched to the uh, DNC and the RNC to put, promote their people to be moderators, mm -hmm. and they said no. They are picked you know, by these organizations without any input from the media. And so it meant that people were watching Mm -hmm. CBSN, um, and that they were aware of what we were doing, and that's why one of the reasons that factored in Four Lane getting uh, that monumental spot. And I do remember when she launched Red and Blue, I was in a, we were somewhere in D.C., and Senator Amy Klobuchar came over to Elaine and said, congratulations on Red and Blue. Mm -hmm. It hadn't even, it had barely launched, mm -hmm. and Senator Amy Klobuchar was aware of it. So that should tell you something about it. But you know what I find interesting, interesting about floating the idea of advertising with podcasts? The, the dilemma for these candidates is that, you know, when I search for a podcast, I search specifically for said podcast. It would be difficult for them to be, to expose themselves to middle-of-the-road um, voters, people who they might have to win over. They're big basically just preaching to the right. choir. Do you, go, do you in a look way. for a Joe Biden podcast? How does that work? I mean, I think that candidates start to see now that you just have to be everywhere at all times, right. whether that's a podcast or whether that's a streaming TV show, because people are watching and consuming news everywhere that they go. But you're right. There is a sense that if you go to one podcast, let's say Pod Save America, which right. tends to cater towards progressive Democrats, that you're not reaching across the aisle. What I mean to say for 2024 is that once it becomes easier to buy a ton of ads at scale across many podcasts, then it's not necessarily, oh, I'm listening to a Democrat progressive show, and I'm an unlikely voter to switch the aisle. What it becomes there is, I'm listening to a podcast about how to raise kids or about how to clean my house, and then I get a political message, because it's just so easy to buy ads across everything. That's when you're going to start to see some movement in political messaging across things like podcasts, as well as streaming, and maybe even, you know, streaming audio, things like Spotify. So it's going to move the needle, but we're not quite there yet. Yeah. Um, you can also fast forward past an ad in a, ponca in a podcast, true. which you cannot do in other platforms. That's right. Sarah Fisher, thank you so much. Sarah, whenever we have thank you on, you. I feel like I get smarter. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. This is really great. <laughs> thank you. Talk to you soon.